adore you The earth is filled with your glory Come on, yeah! The earth is filled with your glory Come on, help me say that
loves us. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us more than we love our own selves. Hallelujah. We owe him the praise. We owe him the honor. We owe him all glory. Hallelujah.
yes, my Sing that one more time. Hallelujah. My hallelujah. My hallelujah. Belong. Come on, let's worship him this morning. You. He's so worthy of hallelujah. praise, of glory, of honor. My hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. All the glory. You lift your hands this morning surrender come on all of the glory belongs to you every breath in your body Hallelujah. every activity of your limbs all, all of the glory, all the glory belongs, belongs to, to him you. oh yes all of the glory all of the glory Just voices. We're gonna worship this morning. My hallelujah belongs to you. Hallelujah. When you didn't think you was gonna hallelujah make it, Jesus. you did anyway. My hallelujah belongs to you. When you thought you had fallen so far from grace and he picked you up. My hallelujah, hallelujah. belongs to you. Hallelujah. He Everything that you have, my hallelujah belongs to you. We can worship him just a little bit 
longer, just a little bit. Come on. My hallelujah belongs to you. Oh, yes. My hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. Hallelujah. He's so worthy. You know, Jesus said that they're going to know that we are his disciples by the love that we have for one another. And man, we need, we need to be showing people that brothers and sisters in Christ have a lot of love for one another. And the world has seemed to up its game in trying to divide the body of Christ. And you know what, they're, 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 they're having victories in different moments, in different pockets. And we wanna fight back. And the way we're gonna fight back is with love, the way we love each other and with prayer and by living for Christ. And you know, the other thing that God has said in his word to us very clear is that when one part of the body suffers at all, what? Suffers. The Lord also told us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And so uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, I'm learning how to do that better when it comes to my African-American brothers and sisters. This year has taught me a lot. And so whether it was the verdict or all the headlines, the shooting in Columbus, like just, I'm just learning to suffer with my brothers and sisters in Christ that have a different perspective or unique perspective that I don't always have. And so um, I'm learning and God's teaching me. And so I'm grateful for the chance to be a student just as much as a teacher. And so I hope to learn. And uh, God's been using your pastor and others, and I pray that he uses you as well. So I'm looking forward to opening the Word together. With that, let's pray and uh, dive into the Word. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. We do not deserve a shred of this love that we just sang about. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. When, when we act better, we don't get more of it. <laughs> and when we misbehave, we don't get less of it. You just love us, and we don't deserve any of it. So God, as I get the joy and the gift of being with my brothers and sisters in Christ here today and bringing the word, God, would you just push me to the side? We just want to hear from you. We just want to open up your word and let your spirit just take those words off the pages and just put them on our hearts. So Holy Spirit, have your way with us. Teach us. Change us. We don't want just information this morning. We want transformation to be different in the name of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well said. Amen. Amen. You know, the other morning, <clears throat> I, was, um, I was driving to CVC actually to teach. It was early morning just a couple weeks ago. And I was just greeted by one of those stunning sunsets or sunrises. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about? Like you're driving, heading east, and all of a sudden, like God's going, good morning. All the purples and oranges and yellows, and it was just one of the most beautiful um, sunrises I, I had ever seen. Um, I know I shouldn't have done this, but while I was driving, I got my camera out, and I'm like, I'm trying to take pictures of this, you know, which never, never do it justice, because when I got back at the church and looked at my pictures, all I could see was telephone poles and trees and houses. You couldn't see the sunrise. It's almost like God says, uh-uh. <laughs> you got to take it in with your own eyes. And as I was driving, looking at the sunrise, I was just filled with awe. I was just filled with awe of who God is, and just, just his love for us, and, and just all that he does for us. Like, just, I was just filled with awe, and I just started thanking God. I just, it was just like a long list of God, thank you, 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 God, thank you. And we have a lot of things to be thankful for, but one of the things we need to make sure we always are most grateful to the Lord for is what we call the gospel the gospel. And the passage we're going to look at this morning is going to take us there. And I invite you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. That's where we're going to be. But, but here's my goal. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to put the cards on the table right now. I, I want to tell you my goal for this morning. I do not want you to leave this morning feeling like you need to do something for God. We're good at that. We, we want to do something for God. We're, we're called to live for him. My goal this morning is that none of us walk out of here feeling like we have to do something for God, but instead that we would just be in awe of what God has done for us. That's where we're going this morning. We just need to be in awe of what God's done for us. Sometimes we need to land there and, and just hang out there before always like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? No, this morning we just want to hang out and be in awe of all that he's done for us. You know, you've been in a series with Pastor Steve called He's Alive. 
And so far, you've looked at the resurrection of Jesus and how he met with the disciples. You looked at Thomas and how, you know, he doubted and how Jesus navigated that with him. Uh, you looked at the ascension of Christ and the giving of the Great Commission. But today, we're going to look at the reality and the significance of of the resurrection of Jesus and the importance of the gospel. Now, when I say gospel, I want to make sure we're all talking about and thinking about the same thing, all right? And so here's just a lengthy but kind of robust definition, a working definition of the gospel to help us. It's the good news that people desperately broken by sin and alienated from God are deeply loved by God and have been restored to him through repentance and belief in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God the Son. And have now been given a new identity as beloved children of God, a new purpose as his missionaries, and a new life to enjoy with God forever. Who's going to repeat that back? Just to... We know that's the substance of it, right? But kind of a smaller, stickier way to say it is that Jesus lived a life we could never live. And he died the death we should have died. And he rose again to give us new life and eternal life forever. That's the gospel. If you want to make it even shorter, it's the person and work of Christ. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the person of Christ, who he is as God the Son, and the work of Christ, what he did on the cross. So this is the gospel. And we need to think about how important the gospel is. And so with that, I want to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your Bibles. And I'm just going to look at verses like 1 through 6, 7, 8. That's where we're hanging out this morning. Now we know that what we're about to hear and read is God speaking through the Apostle Paul to first century Christians living in the Greek town of Corinth. And God is saying through Paul to them, which also is what he's saying to us through Paul through them as well. He says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And what I want to do this morning is, is instead of like, if, if you're looking for three fill-in-the-blank sermon points, I'm going to disappoint you. I just want to unpack a little bit of what we just read. I just want to read, teach, read, teach a little bit, unpack a little bit more about this gospel and the significance of the resurrection. Here's the first thing I find that's interesting. Who is Paul talking to? Is he talking to Christians or non-Christians? What do you think? Is he talking to believers or unbelievers right here? Believers. These are believers in Christ. They already know the gospel. They have already believed the gospel. Yet what is he doing? He's reminding them. I really appreciate what our sister said earlier about John 3.16. Like sometimes we go, oh, that's from when I was a kid. No, that, that, that's forever, right? We never outgrow John 3.16. And we never outgrow the gospel. And so here's the mistake we often make with the gospel. We think the gospel is just the information that we hear and believe to know Christ, to come to know Christ, to, to convert. No, no, no. The gospel is not just what we have to get to know Christ. It's also what we have to grow in Christ. We never outgrow the gospel. We never outgrow the death and resurrection. And so what we see here is that God is speaking through Paul, and he's reminding believers of the gospel. And so look again at verses 1 and 2. It says, I'll remind you of the gospel I preached to you by which you received. So they heard it, and they received it and believed it, right? In which you stand. There's where a lot of us go wrong. You want to know why some of you are struggling with anxiety at a higher level than you've ever had before? You want to know what happens when you lose your cool and get mad at people, your kids, your family, your friends, or some stranger that just ticked you off, right? You want to know what's got you getting more depressed? You want to, you want to know what's getting us off the rails of the train that God has us on his mission? 
is we don't stand in the gospel. And all of a sudden, our identity and our worth and our value and our life's purpose is removed from the gospel and we're standing on something else. We're standing on the opinions of other people. We're standing on what our emotions are telling us that day or that moment. And we deviate from the gospel. God gave us the gospel, not for a moment of conversion, for every day of our life. The gospel shapes every single day of our life. And you can tell when it doesn't. And the people around us, they can tell when it doesn't too. Right? I remind you of the gospel, which I preached to you, right? They heard it, they received it, they stand, and by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believe in vain. We know that our salvation, once we believe, is fixed. It's there, and we're being saved. It's amazing. We, we have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. The salvation thing is phenomenal, how it's a past, present, future reality for us as believers. Unless you believe in vain, what does that mean? There are some people who have placed a shallow belief in the gospel, which means they really never believed. They've heard the information, but it hasn't rooted in their heart. And they might make a profession of faith, but there's actually no possession of faith. But I don't hope there's anyone here this morning like that. And then he says this in verse 3. He says, for I delivered it to you as of, and here's two important words, first importance. Everyone say first importance. First importance. The gospel is primary in our life. There are a lot of great causes that we need to support as we live this life. But right here, God is saying it's of first importance that we're about the gospel. And then he unpacks. Just so you know, 1 Corinthians 15 is, is one of the most gospel-saturated chapters that pays attention to the resurrection of Christ in, in most of Scripture. It's very rich in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ and the significance and value and importance of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is a phenomenal resurrection passage. And we're just hanging out in the first part of it. He says, so I deliver to you the first importance. And then he unpacks the gospel. He says this, that Christ died for our sins. This is so important to realize that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Well, we all know when you look in the Old Testament, God was giving a preview of what was going to happen with the coming Messiah that would come one day. And so he died because God had set this up from the beginning of time. So Christ died according to the scripture. So we're probably thinking about Proverbs 16.10 or Psalms 16.10 which says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. Well, he died. <laughs> he was in the grave. Christ died. We obviously think of Isaiah 53. All the passages that they're messianic prophecies of what was going to happen to the Messiah who died for the sins of mankind. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it was of the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. We think about all the prophecies that pointed to the fact that the Christ would die. And Jesus died. And when you think about the gospel, one of the most important key parts of understanding the gospel is Christ's death. There's a lot of people that have died for what they believe in. But it didn't do the work that Christ did when he died. And so we have to remember, because here's where I think we fall back into kind of lazy theology and lazy believism, like, oh, Jesus died for me. Yes, Jesus died for you. That's accurate. But it gets even more accurate when we say, not only did Jesus die for me, Jesus died in my place. In my place. Like if someone took a bullet for you, if someone pushed you out of the way of a car so that you didn't get hit and took the fender of the car, like that's a different level of appreciation and gratitude. We call that the substitutionary atonement, right? That Jesus took my place, all my sins, all my shame, all my wrongdoings that offend a holy God 
were put on Jesus because he was in my place. They should have been on me. They should have been on me. They should have been on you. So Jesus died. He died in our place. That substitutionary atonement is so important. And then he was buried. Like when we think about the death, like if, the, if Jesus didn't die for our sins, then his death was pointless. It was worthless. But he died in a place, and then he was buried. Evidence, eyewitnesses, that Jesus of Nazareth was put in a tomb. People saw it happen. They saw the dead Christ. He was, he was dead, and he was buried, literally buried in a tomb, verifiably dead. Jesus really did die. I know Pastor Steve probably unpacked that with all these goofy theories that he just passed out. Like, come on, we're not lame. Give us some intelligence, all right? He was dead. He was buried. And then, it's almost like the, the, the drum roll of heaven, Christ rose from the grave. We don't worship a dead Savior. We don't worship a dead Savior. He's alive. He's alive. But it says he rose just as the Scriptures, right, to fulfill Scriptures. We look at that passage. It's just so important that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. What Scriptures? So many scriptures have talked about the Christ would, would come back to life. Here's, here's what we love about God. How he, he takes his word, and when you study his word, he, he tells you hundreds if not thousands of years what he's going to do later. But sometimes you don't catch it until later is where you're at, and you look back. And so we all look at the story of Jonah, right? Jonah, Jonah in the belly of the great fish for how many days? Three and then brought out to life. We think it's just about Jonah, right? No. Jonah was a precursor of what was going to happen to Christ, three days. Jesus connected those dots, by the way, in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 40. It said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Like Jesus is saying, look, connect the dots. And just as Jonah was come, came back to life, you know, Christ was to come back to life according to the scriptures. And here's the thing that we need to understand. And you look, look at these passages here, okay? It says that uh, in verse 5, he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. We have to keep in mind that all that we believe in the gospel, all this that's been recorded that we understand, has been written down by eyewitnesses. They were there, or someone they know was there and saw it. It, it. it still stuns me that people will take the word of a person now about what something happened, whether it's your family history or something that happened earlier in the day, rather than volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of evidence of eyewitnesses that's been captured. Oh man, the other day I was doing this thing, here's what happened. Really? Wow, that's awesome. Oh, Jesus rose. Well, you need to give me more evidence. Like, Seriously? Hundreds of people seeing a dead man walking around isn't enough for you? Like, and captured over 2,000 years and written down? All the manuscripts that we have that capture the evidence? According to the scriptures, these are eyewitness accounts. People saw Jesus raised, just, just, just for fun. I apologize to my sister here who's trying to keep up with me. I'm a, talk fa I'm a fast talker. <laughs> here's, here's some of the appearances of Christ, right? Okay, these are resurrection appearances by eyewitnesses. We, we, don't, we don't worship a myth, okay? Uh, early Sunday morning to Mary Magdalene, then to the women who returned from the tomb, to Peter, to two disciples going to Emmaus, to all the disciples in Jerusalem except for Thomas because he wasn't there in that moment, then all the disciples again, including Thomas, then to seven disciples that were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, then to 11 disciples on the mountain in Galilee, then over 500 disciples at once, then to James, who was his unbelieving half-brother who later came to life. Why did James come to, why did James come to faith? Because he saw his dead half-brother alive. He didn't believe in him until then, right? And to the apostles and probably others during 40 days prior to his ascension at the Mount of Olives when he did ascend. And then just to, you know, put some extra in there, he appeared to Stephen, the martyr, and then he appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, and then he appeared to John on the island of Patmos. Jesus is alive. The gospel, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and he 
rose. Just as God has said. This is the gospel that we believe. This is the power of the gospel. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Charles Octavius Booth. He's a great theologian. He wrote a great little book called Plain Theology for Plain People, right, back in early 1900s. He said this about all what we just talked about. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. It was God's testimony of his sonship and to his own full satisfaction with what Jesus had done as the substitute of sinners in bearing their sin in his own body on the cross. The way was then prepared for calling on men to believe on the Lord Jesus with a faith firm, strong, that cannot be shaken. A faith that honors God our Savior and gives rest to a troubled soul. This is the gospel. You can't, I don't know what you came to church for this morning, but what God wanted you to take today is a reminder of the gospel. The gospel that we've received and that we have to stand in and that we're saved by. And to understand that we talk about the gospel is that death and that burial and the resurrection of Jesus and all that we have because of that. So what does that mean for our life? What does that look like? Well, I just want to spend a few minutes unpacking this. What's the significance of the gospel? The thing is, we have to become very fluent in speaking the gospel. Now, when you learn a language, you become very fluent in it, right? You don't have to work very hard to translate. We don't speak gospel very well. We don't speak it to ourselves very well. How many of you wake up and throughout the day, you speak lies to yourself? Or you let others speak lies about you to your heart. Well, you're, you're stupid. You're dumb. You're this. You're that. Well, here's why. And all of a sudden, this voice of disqualification just wants to speak lies to you. That is not the voice of the Lord. That is never the voice of the Lord. We've got to learn how to speak the gospel that because of his love for us, all the gospel content we're talking about is because of his love for us. There's a book called Gospel Fluency. I'm going to recommend these books in a little bit here, but um, it says this, fighting with gospel truths is trusting in and putting on ourselves all that is true of Jesus and therefore is also true of us in Jesus. I'm going to read that again. Fighting with the gospel truths is trusting in and putting on ourselves all that is true of Jesus and therefore also true of us in Jesus. So when you start speaking gospel to yourself and to others, hey, parents, you know what your kids need to hear you speaking into the life? The gospel. Hey, kids, you know what your parents need to hear you speaking to them? The gospel. Here's what it sounds like when we start to speak the gospel. I'm loved and valued. I'm a child of God. I'm reconciled to God. I've been transferred from death to light and from darkness to light. I've been made new. I have a new heart, a new mind, a new love, a new appetite, a new mission. I've received all God wants and has for me. Joy, hope, peace, truth, holiness, freedom, freedom from sin's power, fruit of the Spirit. Power to live and love like God. I've got a message to proclaim and a mission to live. A journey of growth, maturity, until I'm with Christ face to face. I'm unified and one with the global family of Christ. I'm free to focus on the primary and most important issues on God's heart. I've experienced and have the power of God in me. I've been given Christ's righteousness. I've been made sanctified and holy every day of my life. And I'm reminded that I need Christ every day. Amen. This is what it means to speak the gospel to ourselves. And here's what happens when we do. It helps us with the fears. It pushes back the fears when you speak gospel to yourself. Anxiety, identity struggles, rejection, issues with worth and value, the pursuit of peace, the need for hope, the longing for joy, the sense of purpose. When we deal with mistreatment and persecution and hostility, when, when our lives are just obsessed with worry and anger and apathy, when we feel like we need approval, when we're wrestling with our pride and arrogance. Now, we need to make sure that as followers of Christ, we know the gospel, 
death, burial, resurrection, and we preach the gospel to ourselves on a regular basis, and we live out the gospel and we share it. We got to receive the gospel, we got to preach it to ourselves and learn how to pray it, by the way. And then we live the gospel and we proclaim and share the gospel. And so remember, the gospel doesn't just introduce you to the Christian life. The Holy Spirit uses the gospel to empower you to live the Christian life. Again, when we step back and look at this passage and look at this gospel, the reality and the truth of the death and the burial and the resurrection and the message of God's love that fuels that gets us to sit back and we go, I can do a lot of things for God, but today I just need to step back and be in awe of what God's done for me. Is there anything greater than our Savior's done for us than the gospel? And we have to fall in love with the gospel again. There's a book called Above All, written by another pastor. He says this. He says, the future of the church in America hinges on whether God's people return to the gospel as the central defining element in their lives and the defining focus of their mission. So what does that mean on a personal note? It means this. Here's a question you can ask yourself. What would it look like if we all returned to the gospel as the central defining element of your life? What would your life look like if you returned back to the gospel being the central defining element of your life? What would you stop doing? What would you start doing if the gospel was most important? Most important. And all the other things we're dealing with, all the other stuff, the frustrations in our homes, the frustrations in our culture, those are all secondary. And here's the deception. We get our eyes off the gospel and try to fight these fights without the gospel. But it's the gospel that helps us fight the fights. And to fight them rightly and righteously. And so we have to come back to the gospel. Come back to the gospel. If the gospel is this important to God, it should be that important to us as well. And here's where it starts. Being awed by what God has done for you in the gospel. All that he's done for you in the gospel. So that's my ask today. That's my takeaway. That you would spend conscious, intentional time each day this week being in awe of what God has done for you in the gospel. This is your homework. I'm notorious for homework. Your homework is to every day consciously, intentionally find ways to be in awe of all that God has done for you in the gospel. How, you can write it down. You can put it in your phone to chirp at you when you, you need to have a reminder of the gospel. You can memorize this passage. Whatever you need to do to increase your focus on the gospel and God's love for you. Now, I don't want to make the mistake of thinking that every single one of you have received Christ and believe in the gospel. That would be a mistake. And so if there's anyone here today, or maybe you're watching this a little bit later, and you don't have a relationship with Christ, like I hope you heard very clearly these things between the songs and this time. God loves you. Your sin is a barrier between you and God. And you will never be able to knock down that barrier ever on your own. And God knew that. That's why he sent Christ. It was God's love for you that he sent Christ to die in your place for your sin so that you can have new life now, live differently now, and eternal life in heaven forever, enjoying God forever. And so if you've never done that before, you so say, I need Christ. Um, I'm going to give you the ABCs of faith. Like, if you need to make a decision for Christ, I call it the ABCs. A, you admit that you're a sinner. Your pride doesn't want to do that. Your pride's like, well, those people, no, no, no. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I need the Lord. Admit that you're a sinner. A, B, believe in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for your sin. Believe in who Christ is as God the Son. Believe that his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave gives you Hope, peace, forgiveness, joy, eternity. 
That's B. And C is commit your life to follow Him. Coming to Christ is not a decision you make. Check the box and then you're done. You commit to follow Christ every day of your life. And some days we're going to do great, and some days we're going to stink and fail. And when you fail, not if, when you fail, do you know where you go back to? The gospel. You go back to the gospel. God loves me. I'm his child. These lies are not his voice in my head. It's not what he's saying. I'm loved. I'm valued. I'm worthwhile. And so if you've never done that, just pray the ABCs. God, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I commit my life to follow him. And if you ever do that, I know Pastor Steve and a couple of deacons will be up here this morning. They'd love to talk to you during these last couple songs. Just talk to them and say, I'm giving my life to Christ. And they'll help you take those next steps. But my hope today is that if God has used me in any way just to encourage you to get back to the gospel, remind you of the gospel, the first importance of the gospel, then we're all going to be better for it. And the body of Christ is going to be better for it. And therefore the world will be better for it. Amen? Can we just spend a few minutes in prayer? Let's just pray. Let's just pray. Father, we could go on and on and on about the gospel, on and on about the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. But Father, right now, we just want to make sure that we stop and are just in awe of what you've done for us in the gospel. In fact, I just want to give you a minute. Would you just take a minute by yourself and just you and God, would you just start thanking him? Say, God, thank you for, I'm in awe of, thank you for, would you just in your own heart, your own way right now, just spend a minute just thanking God for what he's given you in the gospel? Just do that. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Father, you are loving, redemptive, extravagant, generous, merciful, gracious, forgiving, wise. Father, you're all powerful. You're sovereign. You are a heavenly Father who's invited us to be your children. You are a Lord who brings us in as your servants to know your plan and to do your will. And you have given us so much. You give, you take away. Help us to focus on what you give more than what you take. We've been chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, and made useful to you, and we thank you for it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. We all sit together. Hey, if this is a, praise God. I'll, I'll have these up on the front with me. If this topic is really important to you, just a few reads I recommend. There's a book called Above All by a pastor named J.D. Greer. Just talks about what it looks like when the gospel's above our political preference and, and uh, all these other things. Like what's, what's, the gospel's got to be above all. What's it look like for a believer in a church? Also, this is a book called Gospel Fluency. It's like, how do you speak the gospel to yourself? How do you speak it to others? Become fluent in speaking the gospel. And this one's really good. It's called Hidden in the Gospel. And it actually helps you understand how to pray the gospel. How can you take what's true of you in the gospel and, and learn to pray it in your life? And so he does a good job with that. And so these are books I recommend. Just be up here if you want to take a peek at them and stuff. But thank you so much for letting me be with you this morning. It's been truly a gift. Let's stand. Let's worship. There's beauty in my brokenness I've got true love instead of pain There's freedom when you captured me I have joy instead of mourning There's beauty in my brokenness I have true love I got true love instead of pain 
there's beauty There's freedom though you captured me I've got joy I've got joy instead of mourning yes. Say you give me joy Down deep in my soul Down deep in my yeah. soul Down deep in my soul been so free caught in your love for me I've never been more secure knowing your heart Lord I've never been so free caught in your love for me I've never been more secure knowing your heart Put your hands together. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I pray you were encouraged by the word of the Lord given through Pastor Chad. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for him. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, the deacons are going to be up here. We're going to go ahead and have, um, be able to give our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. And if you said uh, that prayer, giving your life to the Lord, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you come and give your offering and your tithes, please let the deacon know that you've given your life to the Lord. So that way we can help you take the next step in your faith of walking with the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray for the tithes and offering and also pray for dismissal. And afterwards, please come and give your tithes and offerings and you can be dismissed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for how much you love us. Now, Father, we pray that you bless the tithes and the offerings that we're giving freely unto you. Not that we're trying to buy blessings, but, Father, you have already blessed us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for blessing us in such an amazing way. And this is one way we're able to say thank you for your grace and your generosity for your blessings upon our lives. And Father, I pray that you bless those who are giving unto you. 
Father, we pray that you would increase them, O oh Lord, so they can continue to give unto you and unto your work, O oh Lord. And Father, we pray for those who have a heart to give but don't have to give. Increase them, bless them, give seed to them so they can be a sower into your work, into your kingdom. Now, Father, we say thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you shall do. Cover us and bless us this week, O oh Lord. We pray that our destinations will be safe and without harm. Give us traveling grace as we go throughout our day. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. Amen.